Hey everyone, it's time to Nefis and Chill. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day as you watch this video, and I hope you've been doing well. A lot of you will know at this point that I and others, including game journalists, ESO class representatives, and ESO content creators were remotely invited to preview the pre-PTS Blackwood server build, and now that we're allowed to share with you guys our findings, I've made this video. Attached to the description down below on this YouTube video, is going to be a written form of the findings on the ESO University website. Also want to put out a disclaimer that no screenshots or videos were allowed to be taken of this private server, unlike last year's Graymore uh, pre-PTS preview. The pre-PTS build was a month old, so everything observed was still a work in progress. Uh, the things I'm about to go over are not official patch notes. We were asked to also not go too much into details regarding certain things, such as item set values, item set tooltips. So some things I'll be keeping uh, pre uh, general. Uh, there was also a Q&A session, and most of what was asked or answered will also be shared in the video and the summary. Now, uh, I've asked on Twitter, YouTube, Discord, and on Twitch what information you guys wanted me to uh, get or what you guys want me to look at the most and overwhelmingly most of you said companions so let's go over companions companions how do they work well let's go uh, into it companions will not be as good as players or as smart as players as the developers don't want companions to entirely replace actual players companions are meant for players to transition into content and to be provided with uh, self-confidence to eventually play with other actual players. New players may also intuitively learn from playing around with their companions in regards to their skill rotations or the basics of gearing up. Companions have been observed to break free and do the basic core combat abilities such as blocking. Uh, both my companions I've seen block and so forth. Where can you take these companions? Anywhere in PvE, including four-man dungeons and arenas, and 12-man raids and trials. They are, however, not allowed in solo arenas or PvP zones, including Cyrodiil, Battlegrounds, and Imperial City. Like banker or merchant assistants, companions can be summoned by quick-slotting them or through the collections menu under the Allies category. They are account-wide once acquired through some steps in the Blackwood chapter, and no, they're not on the Crown Store as they come with the Blackwood uh, chapter expansion. Companions cannot exactly fulfill mechanics, and by this, for example, in the Therian Archive, they cannot stand on one of the 12 pads required to be uh, pressed to advance through the next area, or in uh, Navi Harmo, they probably can't go down into portals and do the Eternal Servants. Companions also have health bars and can also die, but you can resurrect them with a soul gem. You can heal and shield your companions as well, while also being able to direct their aggro like you can with the sorcerer's pets. As for the companions themselves, well, there are two companions coming out with the Blackwood chapter. Uh, they're called Bastion and Miri, uh, and they will serve as a foundation for the high potential companion system. Their leveling progression is from level 1 to 20, which affects their combat prowess. Companions also have a report level, or relationship level, which has a, a, a diverse range from having a huge disdain for you to really, really liking you. You can also increase or decrease this report level by committing acts that go against their morality or character. For example, Bastion, he's more of a noble character and won't like you pickpocketing people, but Miri, she's a bit more uh, roguish and will be fine with you pickpocketing people, as an example. Both companions will also have their own dialogue and voice acting uh, options for their background quests and stories. Uh, you can learn more about them by questing with them. Random quips will occur as you adventure together and other neat features. These will change based on your report level. So since I have no friends and want to immerse myself into ESO fur further, I decrease my report level with both of my companions to see what they said to me. And they absolutely hated me, for example. Bastion, he told me, I can suffer fools, dull blades, bland food, and miserable weather. But you, you are testing my patience. While Miri told me, if you're afraid, I'm going to let you die. I've thought about it. 
Anyway, you can access everything they have, including looking at their level, equipment, skills, and other things by talking to them and going into the companion menu through the dialogue option. You can customize your appearance, or rather their appearance, with the outfitting system at the outfitting station. Costumes uh, are available for them to wear, including crown sword costumes, except polymorphs. You can also assign them any of your mounts, and they will write with you on those mounts, although they seemed a little slow on the preview server and couldn't keep up. They will also crouch with you and sprint with you. Uh, and as for companion gear, well, yes, they also have their own specific gear. Your companion's gear is companion specific, so you can find different companion gear pieces ranging from white to purple quality items in various locations throughout the world. You cannot wear your companion's gear, and you cannot give them your player gear. And also, on the side note, a new category has been added to the inventory UI, the companion items category. There are also different types of companion gear. Note that you can mix and match different pieces, pieces of these, whether it's an aggressive helmet piece with a vigorous uh, chest item piece, as these aren't item sets, but simply item pieces that have their own unique traits. Similarly to players, uh, companions have access to one skill bar, three jewelry slots, and seven armor slots. They also have access to their own companion versions of skill lines, including weapon skills, armor skills, guild skills, and class type skills, along with at least one racial passive, or bonus. Companions cannot bar swap as they only have one bar. And the different companion item types are as listed, aggressive, increases damage done by X% percent per piece. Augmented, increases duration of all buffs and debuffs by X%. Percent. Bolstered, reduces damage taken by X%. Percent. Focused, increases critical strike rating by X%. Percent. Prolific, increases ultimate generation by X%. Percent. Quickened, reduces ability cooldowns by X%. Percent. Shattering, increases penetration by X per piece. Soothing, increases healing done by X% percent per piece and Vigorous, increases max health by X% percent per piece. And again, you can mix and match these from what I have uh, observed on the previous server. As for companion skill rotations, your companion's DPS, tanking, or healing rotation, whatever you want to assign them, is based on the order of the skills arranged in their skill bar. That's exactly the same as a player skill bar. Take note that every companion skill, however, has a cooldown as opposed to a global cooldown per cast for players. This will let players think even more about what skills they'd want to slot for their companions. We think overall, just like the Champion Point 2.0 system, there's a lot of potential room here for expansion on both the player and developer side uh, in the companion system for a lot of possibilities ranging from, you know, uh, marrying your companion to theory crafting. Uh, with your companions. Uh, companions' unique class skills are heavily inspired or drawn upon from player class skill lines. Uh, at the moment, uh, Miri is more of a Nightblade and uh, Bastion Halix is more of a Dragon Knight. And I'll show their skills right here. Uh, Bastion Halix's class skills under the damage tree, Lava Whip. Bastion lashes an enemy with flame, dealing X flame damage and setting them off balance for X seconds. Searing a Strike. Bastion slashes an enemy with flame, dealing X flame damage and additional X flame damage over X seconds. Stone Fist. Bastion hurls a uh, chunk of molten rock at an enemy, dealing X physical damage. And he also has a damage ultimate. He deals X flame damage to enemies and stuns them for X seconds while also releasing four lines of fire in a cross formation that deal an additional X flame damage to any enemy they touch. This is kind of a familiar skill that we see a lot of NPCs use. Uh, and under the healing tree, Bastion has Cauterize, which launches a searing fireball at themselves or an ally to cauterize their wounds, healing for X amount of health. And this is specifically used when Bastion or an ally is below a certain percentage of health, which is pretty interesting. As for Obsidian Shield, Bastion calls the Earth to her defense, gra granting a damage shield and their nearby allies that absorbs X damage. While the damage shield holds, healing received is increased by X%. percent. For Molten Weapon, Bastion charges a group's weapons with volcanic power, increasing their damage done by X% percent for X seconds. Pretty interesting stuff here in terms of buffs and debuffs as well. For the Tanking Tree, we have Fiery Grip. 
<laughs> and uh, Bastion can launch a fiery chain to grasp and pull an enemy to them, used when the enemy can be moved and is further than X meters away. Dragon Blood. Uh, Bastion draws on their Draconic Blood, healing for X percent of their max health and reducing their damage taken by X percent for X seconds, used when Bastion is below a certain amount of health. Dark Talons. Bastion Halix calls for Talons from the ground, dealing X flame damage to enemies nearby and immobilizing them for X seconds. Now, Bastion also have one unique passive and also something called a companion perk. His companion perk is called Bastion's Insight. Potions looted from chests and monsters have a X percent chance to be improved by Bastion's Insight. And I don't think this is gonna, you know, turn a trash pot into a tripod, but we'll see. As for the passive, Tough, uh, it increases his max health by X percent and damage done by X percent. Now let's go over Miri Alendis' class skills. She has a very different uh, set of skills uh, compared to Bastion. Her damage tree includes Veiled Strike. She slashes an enemy, dealing X magic damage and setting them off balance for X seconds. She also has Teleport Strike. She flashes through the enemy, or sorry, excuse me, flashes through the shadows and then ambushes an enemy, dealing X magic damage. She also has Assassin's Blade. She thrusts a magic blade with lethal precision to finish off an enemy dealing X magic damage, and this is only used when the enemy is under a certain amount of health. She also has a damage ultimate similar to Bastion. Miri Alendis marks an enemy and exposes their weakness, causing them to take X% percent more damage for X seconds. While the enemy is exposed, she builds up to a single killing shot, unleashing a massive bolt that deals X physical damage. And again, this is all work in progress, so maybe there will be more ultimates uh, per tree. As for her healing tree, she has Strife, similar to a player in Life Blades. She steals an enemy's life force, dealing X magic damage, and healing themselves or an ally around them for X amount of health. She also has something called Blood Transfusion. She infuses an ally with blood, healing them for X health over X seconds, and she also has Drain Power. She siphons the vigor from the blood of her enemies, or dealing X magic damage and their allies um, for X health, or rather healing them for X health. Also, for her tanking tree, uh, she has Blur. She surrounds herself in a phantasmic aura, dodging the next attack made against them while also reducing their damage taken by X percent for X seconds. Uh, this is used when she is below spe a specific amount of health. She also has Aspect of Terror, which is a fear ability. She terrifies nearby enemies, causing them to cower in fear for X amount of seconds. She also has Shadow Cloak, where she shrouds herself in refreshing shadows, healing for X percent of their max health and becoming invisible for X seconds, causing most enemies to stop attacking them. Uh, and this is used when she's also below a certain amount of health as well. So there's some built-in uh, smart AI in regards to a lot of these skills. And as for her companion perk and passive, her Miri's Expertise, treasure chests found through the treasure maps and in the Overland have a chance to provide additional loot from hidden compartments. Uh, her dynamic passive increases her damage done by X% percent and healing done by X% percent as well. Now that we've gone over the companion skill lines, let's go over the weapon skill lines that they have. For example, the two-hander, the rest of the stuff, and other skill lines that we're going to talk about from this point on, they're not uh, Bastion or Miri exclusive. They are universal to both of them and what we assume to be uh, future companions. For example, the two-hander skill line includes Uppercut, Cleave, and Reverse Slash, and these are pretty self-explanatory on the screen. Uh, we also have the rest of the staff abilities that a lot of players will be familiar with, including Regeneration, Blessing and Protection, and Steadfast Ward. One Hand Shield includes Puncture, which is also acting as a taunt, Shield Charge, and Defensive Posture. And we also do have a dual skill line with Flurry, Whirlwind, which is also going to be used uh, below a certain amount of health on enemy targets, and Blade Cloak. As for the Destruction Staff skill line for the Companions, uh, they only have access, at least as of the preview, uh, the Destructive Touch skill, Wall of Elements, and Impulse. And uh, each, of course, type of Destructive Touch, like Flame Touch, uh, Frost Touch, and Shock Touch, 
like just like for players have uh, additional effects. For example, fl frost touch uh, taunts enemies for X amount of seconds. Uh, flame touch knocks enemies back, and so forth. As for the bow skill line, companions can use snipe. Uh, good thing they're not going to PvP. <laughs> uh, arrow spray and poison arrow. And a lot of these tooltips, as noted, are uh, very, very heavily inspired or the same as uh, player skills. Now we're going to move on to their other abilities, including armor abilities and guild skill lines. Their companion armor abilities available to your companion. Should your companion have at least five pieces of each armor type equipped, uh, just like players need to have five pieces of heavy to use a heavy armor skill, uh, will be the following. Haste, the light armor skill. The companion focuses their magical energies inward, re resetting the cooldown of all their other abilities. Vanish, the medium armor skill. The companion dis disappears in a puff of smoke, invisible for becoming invisible for 10 seconds and causing most enemies to stop attacking them, used when below X percent health. And Bulwark, the heavy armor skill for companions. Companion becomes an unstoppable defender, blocking and reflecting all attacks for X seconds. It's used only when they're below X percent health while fighting a difficult monster. I'm not exactly sure what entails a difficult monster, although from my testing, it seems to be uh, bosses. And as for companion guild skills, uh, they do have access to fighter's guild, mage's guild, and undaunted skill lines. Uh, for the fighter's guild, they have access to silver bolts, just deals uh, damage to uh, enemies with the silver bolt skill, but also double damage if the enemy is undead, daedra, or werewolf. They also have access to circle protection, which may be huge for a lot of uh, solo players or people interested in bringing companions to uh, either normal or vet dungeons. And they actually um, also have access to Meteor, not as an ultimate from the Mages Guild, as of the preview, but as a skill. Uh, so there's that as well. They also have something called Reverse Entropy. They envelop themselves and an ally with stabilizing magic, healing for X health over X seconds. And we also do have Equilibrium, where instead of, you know, uh, the, you know, like a player exchanging health for Magicka, they actually barter with Oblivion for power. Uh, generating X amount of ultimate, because they do, again, have access to ultimates, or at least one ultimate. And the Undaunted skill line includes Blood Altar, uh, which will provide the uh, same effects, technically, uh, just as player Blood Altars do, except uh, the companion Blood Altar seems to be healing for an X amount of health every X second for however many seconds, while also providing the same Blood Funnel synergy. They also have access to the ranged taunt uh, Inner Fire, uh, where they can taunt an enemy from range, and this is unlike the sword and board taunt, uh, it's used only when the enemy is not already taunted, so keep that in mind, uh, which this may also change as well when PTS comes around. Uh, bone shield, companions surround themselves with a whirlwind of bones, uh, you know, shielding for X percent or max health for X seconds, and of course, just like the player bone shield synergy, they also get a damage shield uh, provided to the group. Now that we've talked about companions, and there will be some Q&A later uh, in regards to companions that were asked during the uh, preview event, but uh, now that we're done talking about companions, I want to talk about the other uh, information about the game. And Blackwood is going to bring uh, new and powerful item sets, and in addition to a pretty big change that I think a lot of people will be excited about, uh, again, we're not allowed to share exactly what the item sets do that are coming out with Blackwood. However, I can share the general concepts of each item set and a few other details. Uh, in regards to this huge change I referred to earlier, uh, in regards to perfected and non-perfected, you can now mix perfected and non-perfected versions of the same item set. So, assuming you have four non-perfected false gods and one perfected false gods equipped, you will actually still retain that complete five-piece bonus of false gods. And this is pretty huge for, you know, the players who are progressing to finalizing their uh, perfected gear setups. And now there's a total of, uh, uh, there's actually quite a few sets that are coming out as well with Blackwind that I would like to talk about. Uh, let's start with the trial sets first that are coming out from the new trial Rock Groove in both non-perfected or normal version and perfected or veteran forms. So, set A offers damage gain, 
based on missing resources against monsters. Set B offers major force to you and your group. I don't want to get too into this. Uh, <laughs> and we'll move on. Set C offers stamina and magic and sustain for your group. And set D is a stamina damage set. Uh, all I can say at this point is that the, all, all, every set seems pretty promising. For the Blackwood Overland sets, we have set A that offers ultimate and health regeneration, set B a stamina damage proc set, and set C a really cool ice theme or rather ice damage base set. And for the craftable sets that can be found in the Blackwood zone uh, through their crafting stations is set A which offers unique damage buffs. Set B, which offers a boost to the effectiveness of your weapon traits. And set C, uh, which offers healing and sustain based on damage. And of course, where can we uh, be without talking about mythics? I know a lot of people uh, asked if I could look at the mythics and I didn't. But again, I cannot get into the specifics, unfortunately, but I will, again, relay the general concept. So there are five new mythic items coming out. Mythic A is a ring that offers max stats in increasing in increments. Uh, Mythic B is a helmet that offers max stats and mitigation. Mythic C is a pair of medium pants that grants damage stats. Uh, Mythic D is a ring that affects crafting nodes. Ooh. And Mythic E is a necklace that reduces ultimate cost. Now, I'd be done talking at this point, but there's actually another surprise in terms of item sets. And that's going to be monster sets. And you're like, wait, Nefes, I mean, there's no DLC dungeons arriving with Blackwood, is there? No, there isn't. But there is going to be Imperial City monster sets. Not quite sure how to get these just yet, but I did see them on the preview server. But there are a total of three new powerful two-piece monster sets with their names based on the district bosses coming out from the old Imperial City uh, PvP DLC zone. Now again, go over the general concepts. Monster Set A offers high damage mitigation. Monster Set B offers reactionary damage gain. And Monster Set C offers immunity to crowd control effects for some time. Uh, and that's all the item sets that are coming out. As far as I could see, There's pro there might be more. There might be, uh, obviously, more changes to existing item sets on the PTS. So I'll see you guys in about a uh, few days or so on the PTS. Uh, we also have new styles and outfits coming out with the Blackwood chapter. And this includes the, anc the Ancestral Akaviri style, which I think a lot of people theorized about on Reddit. We also do have the Ivory Brigade style coming out. And we also do have the Deadlands Gladiator outfit style. And I think this is honestly the best one I've looked at on the preview. And, I, <laughs> and it's the Dramora Kinreeve outfit style coming out with Blackwood. Uh, as far as, and you know, a lot of people ask me for whatever reason, oh, uh, you know, can you look at the crown store? And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, as far as I could see, there were no new crown store items seen on the preview server. And that's most likely because they want to keep that under wraps until the PTS. Now I want to talk about other changes, including, yes, new champion point slottables. And again, I can't get into the specifics, but uh, I will go over it regardless. Uh, new champion point slottable nodes are added in such a way that you don't have to go beyond the current uh, nodes or lines or trees of progression to get to them. So basically, you don't really have to grind more champion points to unlock these new slottable nodes, uh, which is a really great thing that they did, uh, at least on the previous server. And uh, there's five. There's a total of five new champion point slotable nodes. Uh, one of them is a new damage slotable node that has been added in the Warfare constellation. I'll kind of let you guys guess as to what kind of that is, what kind of node that is. And there's other. Uh, there's four other new slotable nodes that have also been added to the Warfare constellation that specifically involve healing. Again, can't get into details before the PTS, but. I think the concepts of these new nodes will certainly make endgame raiders, dungeoneers, PEPers, and others definitely think about these as options, like as serious options, uh, unlike a few of the options we already have on live. Uh, no passive champion points have been added, as the focus of CP 2.0 has uh, always been on horizontal progression and choices, rather than you know vertical progression of a uh, power gain. Now, there's another huge change coming to the Elder Scrolls Online, and I think this is something 
absolutely I think anyone will like regardless of what kind of player you are and that's going to be the Seals of Endeavors um, and please note that the Seals of Endeavors is still a work in progress as I'm talking about it so just keep that in mind uh, the Endeavors is a new task system in the group and party interface which will appear alongside other existing functions such as group finder and battlegrounds uh, there will be at least two types of tasks for acquiring the Seals of Endeavors, and there are at least 60 different and unique tasks you can fulfill, from ranging from completing a quest, to killing bosses, to crafting an item, to even you know harvesting nodes. Uh, fulfilling these endeavors will grant you a new type of currency called the Seals of Endeavors, in addition to other rewards such as XP and items. And you can use these seals to purchase Crown Crate items. <laughs> and they function like crown gems. You can actually save them up. There's no limit on how many you can have, and they are account-wide. And again, you can use these to buy uh, items from the active season of crown crates and not from the past seasons. But regardless, this is a really cool way for you to participate in, in you know, in-game activities or tasks in order to get crown crate currency. Um, and you don't need to buy crown crates or whatever to get crown gems, which is a different currency. Uh, so that's pretty cool. That's another new change coming. Uh, I think a lot of people will be hyped up about. Uh, the new furniture, uh, I did see the at least 10 achievement furnishings available for purchase with gold in the city of Leowin, including banners, uh, Argonian-themed furniture, and Deadlands-themed furnishings. Uh, there's perhaps more furnishings to come, as, again, this was on the preview server. Um, but yeah, now I'm going to talk about my next favorite thing. And I think a lot of you uh, follow me for, you know, raid content or trials or endgame PvE. And I'm going to talk about Rock Grove. That's right. The new trial. I'm going to talk about the details, the mount. Uh, oh, wait. I already saw that. <laughs> yeah, there's a mount coming. But anyway, uh, an Argonian and Daedric themed trial called Rock Grove. The story of Rock Grove involves an innocent Argonian tribe and their Zanmir, which is their temple or site, uh, being besieged by a very hostile, chaos-worshipping Argonian tribe. It is not a mini-trial. It's not like Cloudrest. It's not like a Solemn Sanctorium. Instead, it's a full trial, complete with three bosses with three hard modes and somewhat lengthy trash. Of course, the preview server is a month behind, meaning there have been more balancing and monsters added uh, since uh, I played it. Uh, and the feedback from the endgame rating community has been heard in regards to Trifecta, otherwise known as the Hard Mode Speedrun No Death reward. Unlike Kynes Aegis and like Sunspire, the Trifecta reward is a mount. And it's called the Solzon Flesh Ripper, drew an Argonian ritual imbued by the Razor Prince's Chaos. This former Wawa mount seethes with both fury and destruction and conflagration touched form. Only the strong willed can control this beast. Perhaps that's you. And yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I couldn't really get to see the mount on the preview, but the icon itself, I mean, that looks pretty that looks pretty legit. Uh, the the mount is also classified as well as a heavyweight in your collections. Uh, and the speed run uh, achievement, Rock River Sprinter, as of the preview server, is 30 minutes, which actually starts when you first engage the enemies, as opposed to entering the trial encounter or instance like Veteran Halls of Fabrication or Veteran Sunspire. Uh, and before you ask, no, uh, as far as I could tell, you can't skip all the ads because you have to go through doors that require you to kill the ads. I hope they keep it that way. Anyway, uh, the achievements and rewards are as follows, or rather the more interesting ones. Uh, Rock Grove Completed Achievement. Uh, this is going to grant you the normal title of Defender of Rock Grove and also a die color called Glenbridge, Grid, uh, Glenbridge Green. Excuse me. And there's the next achievement on the list is Rocker of Conqueror, and it's going to give you the Ka'uzith Warrior veteran title, along with Solzon Raider body markings. And the Rocker of Vanquisher will give you Zavaka's Scourge, which is the hard mode title, and the Solzon Raider, Raider face markings to complete your Solzon Raider body markings. And yes, there is no skin as far as I could tell, it's just the markings, um, the face, and the Body markings, which will, I guess, will serve as a complete skin anyway. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the Soul Savior achievement gives you the No Death Hard Mode Speedrun title of the Stone Kissed. And of course, uh, just like God Slayer uh, and of course uh, Dawnbringer, 
uh, for the Dombring Memento and the Godslayer God Mount, you need to complete not just the trifecta, but also the other miscellaneous achievements, which grants you the title of Stone Talker, along with the Souls on Flesh Ripper Mount. And uh, just want to read these descriptions out for the Souls on Raider face markings and body markings. Souls on tattooists often fall into a bloody revelry when applying face paint to their warrior kin. Acidic dyes make their frenzied artistry dangerous for the eyes, but those who lose their sight in droves of chaos are doubly blessed. As for the body markings, the Souls on Raider oath taking ceremony includes tracing a marsh green pattern upon height and scale. The dye's acidic scent hints at the level of burning pain involved in this exaltation of chaos. Now, I want to talk about the Rock Grove bosses, because obviously, what <laughs> what else is there to talk about besides, uh, you know, uh, the rewards? There's obviously the content itself. So the Rock Grove bosses, again, three bosses, three art moods. Um, and the preview server group uh, that coordinated together, we did a full normal run and a post-boss one veteran clear run. Uh, there also appeared to be a mini boss as well before the last boss. But anyway, let's go over the three main bosses. Uh, the first boss that you encounter is Oxelzo. Ox Ox <laughs> uh, the Argonian behemoth boss similar to Ruins of Mazatun Zalner. Uh, he has fire behemoth like ads called Havocrol Annihilators, lots of death hopper ads, uh, cleansing mechanics, and so I'm not going to get too much into it. Uh, the Flame Herald Basse. Uh, she is an Argonian necromancer who turns into a Goliath, and she also has a bunch of adds, including flesh abominations and uh, fire beams, in addition to other mechanics. And of course, the last boss, last but not least, is Zavaka. And uh, this is a Daedric Harvester, and she's a lot bigger than your average uh, Harvester. Uh, and I think this is probably one of the coolest uh, fights I've seen in a while, and I think one of the coolest and most obvious fight mechanics are actually, for those of you who may not, who may be, who may know what I'm talking about, are kind of reminded me of the Shurochi, the corrupted fight from Destiny 2's Last Wish Raid. So there, there's, 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 there's definitely some really cool elements of this fight that uh, I, I, we couldn't get to see on Vet, but even on normal, it was, it was really like uh, astonishing. So I'm really looking forward to this. And obviously, PTS will have details about the health, health and all that. And of course, that's all always uh, subject to change based on player feedback. But anyway, let's move on to the Rock Grove mobs. Uh, and the mobs are honestly like reminiscent of both kinds, Aegis and Mob Lorcage trash mobs, or base pop as uh, Finlinks call them. Uh, there are elite ads, and at times both a clear or unclear priority order as to how you should tackle these on. Um, especially on VET. Most likely, we'll figure this out on PTS between optimized groups, but there seems to be options, I would say, uh, in response to mechanics that they do for tackling the trash mobs piece by piece if necessary for uh, lower end groups. And the mobs include Death Hoppers, Souls on Fire Mages, Souls on Soldiers, Menders, Assassins, Durzogs. Um, we have Dremora Dreadnoughts, Armamancers, Conjurers, and we also do have Elite Adds such as the Hunters, Shamans, Reavers, Butchers, uh, or rather the Havocrow Butchers, Savages, Torchcasters. Uh, we also have a fire, you know, several fire beams littered throughout the trial. And again, the mini boss I talked about earlier was an Ash Titan. So not, not sure what that's, that was about, but I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about the Blackwood Zone details and... Uh, I, I realize that this is a pretty long video, but bear with me here. So uh, the Blackwood Chapter Zone is typical of the other chapter zones, such as Northern Ellswear, Morrowind, Somerset, and Western Skyrim. It's quite large and introduces a whole bunch of quests, including seven zone story quests, which uh, amounts to over 30 hours of content. Uh, a lot of people will probably ask me, how big is it? Uh, I would say it's definitely bigger than... Uh, definitely as big as Western Skyrim, or bigger than Morrowind. Uh, the map of Blackwood, at least on the preview server, is actually quite big. There are no underground zones like Greymoor and Markarth Blackreach Caverns. Uh, on the world map, it may stretch from near Northern Ellsworth all the way towards the DLC zone of Merkmar to the southeast. Not finalized yet. Uh, we'll see on the PTS. And the zone includes seven way shrines, six locales, 18 sky shards, three set stations as listed above, and 10 new lore books. 
Uh, the port city of Leowin, lore-wise, is a bit bigger, apparently, during the Second Era, compared to, uh, you know, Test 4's Oblivion, but has a similar layout to it. The town of Gideon is also introduced uh, with the Blackwood chapter. Uh, speaking of Leowin, and, you know, a lot, uh, actually, surprisingly, a few people asked me this, or to check this out, uh, the city may actually become a serious contender uh, for you know, players to do their writs due to its uh, tightly condensed and convenient layout for doing those crafting writs as fast as possible, meaning Vivek City in Morrowind and Alinor in Somerset, to name a couple uh, popular spots for doing writs, may actually see some serious competition. And I actually did attempt to find out where the, you know, the writ drop-off location was. I actually did crafting writs. Uh, you're welcome <laughs> on the preview server. But... It's, it did not show me the uh, drop-off location in Leowin. So that has yet to be determined, I think, uh, by the developers. At least uh, by, the P by the time PTS comes around, I, I hope they finalize it. Also, the city of Leowin also has a, uh, other amenities that other capital cities in ESO has, including respect shrines, which are housed in the Chapel of Xenathar, the Fighters Guild, Mages Guild, Stables, six guild trader spots available for, hi for hire, and uh, Vampire Werewolf Cure NPC and an Outlaw's Refuge. And of course, uh, despite the zone being displayed as a work in progress on an old server build, the details of the zone were still quite enjoyable to traverse and venture through. Uh, you can encounter some previous characters you've met in the past, no spoilers, don't worry, while also meeting fascinating characters such as, uh, Ilazi, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, Ilahizu, the Magnificent, who offers to take you on a wild ride, as if he was your Aladdin to your Jasmine. Uh, there are a number of world bosses, one of which was actually incredibly difficult, uh, surprisingly. Uh, Delves and a couple of public dungeons were also present on the uh, map of Blackreach, or Blackwood, excuse me. There are at least 60 Blackwood-related achievements for players to progress and work through. Uh, perhaps one of the most notable features coming with the Blackwood zone are the Deadlands portals, these are, as of the preview, actually difficult to find. Once you enter through a Deadlands portal, you are taken literally into the Deadlands where abominable creatures, including harvesters the size of buildings, roam around. There seem to be both treasure chests and heavy sucks litter littered throughout uh, these Deadlands encounters. The format of these instances are similar to dungeons, perhaps being most similar to the veteran dungeon uh, City of Ash 2, which also takes place in the Deadlands. There's ways of adds, uh, at least one mini boss and elite mobs that you need to defeat as you go through the lava, smoke, dark towers, and other structures towards the final boss encounter, after which you need to break a sigil stone to end the instance for your rewards. Uh, these actually may prove challenging to solo players, uh, to, to a lot of players actually, uh, similar to how Hero Storms turned out, although other people can find the Deadlands portals too and come with you, or you can bust out your companion if need be. Uh, we also tested, uh, can someone in our group enter the portal, and can we port to them after they find the portal? And it didn't seem like we could, but that may also change on the PTS. Next thing I want to talk about, and we're almost done, is going to be the new tutorial. And this was kind of uh, teased in one of the ESO lives on Twitch stream, on Bethesda's Twitch stream. And this new tutorial actually checked out, I uh, made a new character and checked out the tutorial. And instead of being plopped into the chapter zone or the cold jail cell of Cold Harbor, as you have for the past seven years in the Elder Scrolls Online, a new player or a new character is, in is instead transported to the Isle of Balfira, which is the home of Clan Dureni. But don't worry, you're still a prisoner as is test tradition. You talk to Norianwei, who is a member of the Dureni's intelligence guild, Cinderol. She greets and interrogates you, telling that you and a Daedric harvester called Shiazel came through your respective portals in an area known as the Key Rites Gallery. What commences after she releases you from your cell is, I would say, a much, much better and engaging tutorial compared to the old Cold Harbor one. Uh, it forces you to actually go over the basic core combat abilities and tips, such as blocking, breaking free, light attacking, heavy attacking, bashing, and so forth, before it lets you progress further. If you can't, at, uh, if you can't at a certain point um, fulfill like uh, breaking free or bashing a target, it doesn't let you go on. So that that's something cool. Uh, I, I would take a note of. It also eases you into the game. 
with uh, well-timed on-screen tips and advice in regards to why you're doing the things you're doing and what you're doing. Uh, however, this tutorial is still a far cry from player main guides or videos that go into far greater details of, you know, theory crafting or what not to do as a new player. But, you know, it's, it still gets the job done in a much more engaging way. And I think newer players may get more out of this tutorial than the previous tutorial. Uh, perhaps the most notable part about this tutorial is your access to the Key Rights Gallery. Uh, remember those warp paintings in Super Mario you could go through the, to land in, you know, different worlds? Well, for new players or new characters, the Key Rights Gallery is basically a room full of different portals for you to choose from instead of, you know, putting you in the newest chapter zone, which often caused headaches when, you know, older players brought their newer player friends into the Elder Scrolls Online. So now you can choose from this room to go into a specific chapter or starting zone instead, such as one of the first uh, three starter islands like Bleak Rock Isle or whatever, or a chapter zone like Ellsworth, Somerset, and Blackwood. And once you go through uh, a specific portal to start a specific part of your ESO adventure, it doesn't seem like you can go back to the tutorial zone or Key Rights Gallery, although this may change in the upcoming Blackwood PTS build. So that's pretty cool. And uh, there's a few more things we're gonna talk about, and probably, and this is again last, but not last, but also not least. Uh, it's finally here, guys! An in-game action duration reminder. Uh, if you don't know what an action duration reminder is, it's basically a PC add-on that tracks uh, the duration of your skills after you cast it. And you know, it's no secret that console players on Xbox or PlayStation are at a mass massive disadvantage compared to PC players in ESO due to the lack of access to add-ons that can enhance or augment the default game uh, UI or provide more information during fights. And, you know, it was really surprising to see this, uh, but yeah, Zoss has actually introduced an in-game timer per ability you cast on your skill bar. There will, there will now be an integrated action duration reminder that will allow all players to see how much time is left on their damage over time effects, buffs, and other skills. And this is incredibly significant, particularly for console players who will now be able to perform dynamic rotations much more easily as opposed to largely sticking to static rotations. And yes, you will also be able, you'll also be able to see how much time you have left on your back bar skills as well. Uh, this is also a work in progress as, in my opinion, uh, the UI could definitely be improved further. Uh, so hopefully the PTS will see to more better improvements uh, in regards to the uh, in the new in-game action duration reminder. And again, that's pretty that's pretty poggers. All right, so ESO console enhanced clients. I want to talk about as well while we're on the topic of a console. Uh, so the following are the confirmed client specs for the new ESO console enhanced versions of uh, the game. Uh, we have fidelity mode, which gives you 30 FPS at 4K. Uh, we have performance mode, which is, which gives you 60 FPS at 1440p, um, and we also do have uh, different fidelity and performance modes for the Xbox Series S as opposed to the Xbox Series X and PS5 specs. So uh, Xbox Series S will have a lower quality on fidelity and and performance mode. So uh, they will ha an, a, a, a S would have 1080p for performance, 1440p for fidelity at the uh, respective FPS listed above. Uh, in regards to the console enhanced clients, shadows, ambient inclusion, lighting, details, all that has been revamped for console performance and quality. Other improvements uh, that I, I will touch upon here is that console voice chat will be updated to make in-game voice chat a lot more reliable. I think a lot of PlayStation and Xbox players have had difficulty and said go to uh, a different voice service or an Xbox party chat or something like that. Uh, there will also be more combat performance work. We don't really know the exact details just yet. Also, uh, one thing that a lot of people will like, I think, if uh, you don't like listening to outside music while you play ESO, is that you can actually switch between different soundtracks in the game. Whether it was the original soundtrack or a, the Morrowind soundtrack, or maybe you like the uh, Somerset soundtrack, I don't know. But yeah, last thing on the list <laughs> that we're going to talk, talk about in this very lengthy video is uh, some of the Q&A that, uh, that commenced during the, uh, the preview events uh, session. And uh, a lot of the other Q&A that I'm not gonna mention has already, be, has already been mentioned basically by me when I'm presenting the information to you guys earlier on. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. So the first question that someone asked, will companions have an effect on server performance? And the answer was the devs have been extremely careful in regards to the implementation of the companion system so as to not have a detrimental effect on the game performance. And I can definitely see this with the whole cooldown thing. Um, question two was, do companions affect XP gain for players and groups? And this is actually a pretty good question. Uh, and the dev answer was basically no. So, a scenario, so just as a scenario, or as an example, let's say one player gets 100 XP. Uh, a player with their companion will still get 100 XP, but the companion gets 25 XP. So companions don't steal XP from you or your group uh, that you're grinding with. And uh, question three, class changes, CP system changes, item set changes. And, you know, a lot of people are, always have this anxiety or, uh, you know, anticipation in regards to, you know, a shakeup of the meta or whatever. Uh, but the devs answered nothing too crazy that would drastically change the game as of now. Their focus is on performance improvement. But however, there also may be potentially important changes to proc sets that both PvP and PvE players will need to pay attention to. Question four. Any PvP changes? Any PvP content? Uh, and the dev answer was focus on PvP right now is performance, not content. They don't want to add things to Cyrodiil or change things in Cyrodiil. For example, uh, destructible mile gates and bridges initially had huge negative effects on the PvP for performance. And the developers just don't want to break the game. So uh, in the meantime, there will be new cosmetics and you know new gear for the PvP crowd. However, performance remains number one priority. And uh, question five, will overlaying content be made harder? And probably not anytime soon. Question six, will companions have their own inventories so you can get them to carry your stuff? No. And question seven, companion item sets. Uh, no sets yet, but there is companion gear, as I have already gone over. The majority of the power, however, comes from their combat level, which goes from, again, 1 to 20. Question eight, will companions get player item drops in dungeons and trials and so forth? And the answer is no. Question nine, will companions be affected by players' champion points? And the answer was no. Question 10, how will the downloads for the new console clients work? The Xbox player's clients should automatically update while PlayStation players need to download the update. And the last question that I'm gonna mention here, the companion skills seem heavily influenced by classes. Will these be expanded upon later? And the answer is yes, uh, absolutely. The companion system coming out with Blackwood is a starting point. There can be much to expand upon at a later time. And another question was asked as well. Uh, is Dremora the next playable race in ESO? And the dev answer was, but yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. And big thank you to ZeniMax Online Studios for yet again inviting me and the channel to uh, review the preview server. It was really cool to see, uh, really, really excited. Hopefully you guys are also excited about the upcoming Blackwood chapter. And yeah, and thank you guys so much for your support uh, up until now for the past few years. And definitely let me uh, know if you have any questions out in the comments below or you can come to the ESOU Discord. And if you want more information in regards to the Blackwood PTS and other upcoming uh, changes to the Elder Scrolls Online, definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and yep, again, thank you so much and I'll see you soon.